practice in that practice. And so uh, seeing the writing on the wall, I was like, well, let me just transition and just start my own practice. And so it's been a, it's been a good breakup. We still co-treat a lot of patients. They refer to me, uh, folks who don't want injections. And, uh, and, and so it's been a, a good start. Um, we're going into our fifth year and um, yeah, it's been a wild ride so far. So I'm probably one of the newer practices compared to where you guys have been working, um, but it's, it's been fun. So uh, Dr. Halasa asked that I talk about endothelial dysfunction. I've got a couple of case studies too. So it'd be great to um, get people's input as we close out after I go do a, a, a re article review. Okay, so I guess I'll just get right st get started, huh, Bill? Let me do share screen here. If you um, share the screen down at the bottom. Let's see, share screen, there we go. Okay, now let me just get to my art, my slides here. There we go. Oops, spoiler alert. Let's do slide view. Go up here to the, uh, yeah. There you go. All the way to the beginning. There we go. All right. So the um, article I'm just going to give some background on, it's called Endothelial Dysfunction and Chronic Inflama Inflammatory Diseases. Came out in 2014. And what the authors did, they're from the University of Iowa Medical School. They uh, did a review of all the articles having to do with endothelial dysfunction published from 1982 to 2014. Um, so there's a lot of the references for this article was over 133 articles. So a lot of things that they reviewed. And, um, you know, endothelial function, just, just to um, review what they, how they defined it. Uh, was the failure of the endothelium to perform physiological functions in the regulation of vascular tone, cellular adhesion, vascular smooth muscle migration, and resistance to thrombosis. And, you know, the endpoint of a lot of cardiovascular events. Um, one thing that was useful is they did review tests to assess endothelial function. And uh, what's been done in the past, there hasn't been anything that's been able to um, translate well into clinical practice. Um, up until this point. So there is a, one thing they described was a forearm blood flow or the FBF. And that talks about, you know, it uses endothelial dependent vasodilation assessed by acetylcholine infusion with resultant vasodilation induced by the ENOS and prostacyclin. And you have, uh, it's a positive test for dysfunction if you get impaired vasodilation in response to the acetylcholine. You know, the pro with this, it is very re reproducible and accurate. But the con is it requires arterial cannulation, which is not as useful in larger studies. They also talked about um, FMD, flow mediated vasodilation, which is currently most widely used, um, uses ultrasound to measure changes in the brachial artery diameter in response to shear stress induced vasodilation, which is an endothelium dependent process. So they use a blood pressure cuff on the forearm distal to the brachial artery until the flow is stopped and released after a specified period of ischemia and they assess for the resultant hyperemia. Pardon my typos there. Um, and you get enhanced arterial flow which shows functional endothelium. So it's great that this is non-invasive but technically demanding um, if you have someone who's not too, um, you know, as far as their technical expertise in the use of the ultrasound. And then you have the microvascular vasodilation, and, which isn't widely used. And you know that also includes PET scans and TEE. Let's see, how do I do this here? Okay. Um, using laser Doppler imaging uh, to assess microvascular perfusion. So there's just not much um, studied in the use of studying endothelial function with um, microvascular vasodilation. Other things that has been used since 24, before 2014 um, are plasma biomarkers. So on the endothelial surface of the cell, um, this is to review, uh, you've got inflammatory cytokines, the intracellular adhesion molecules of vascular cell, um, adhesion molecules and e-selectin. And these are, the prognostic value is limited due to poor reproducibility. Uh, you've got the e-selectin and the ICAMs that are 
uh, increase, show in, increased risk of cardio, cardiovascular disease. So there are other things that um, have shown some promise, the ADMA, which stands for asymmetric dimethyl arginine, and it inhibits a, a ENOS. And it's high, when its plasma levels are high, you have low nitric oxide levels. And so they found that in hypertension, diabetes, hyperlipidemia, chronic renal insufficiency, those levels are elevated and is associated with increased cardiovascular event risk. So that's what's been available prior to 2014. As far as relative risk in um, cardiovascular disease, so uh, what you see here, in all of these autoimmune and chronic diseases, you do have significant increased morbidity, morbidity and mortality in cardiovascular um, events. That's pretty much what that table shows. This is also from the article, um, just outlines you know, the, uh, what inflammation does. And you can look at the TNF-alpha up here, protein, TNF protein binding to the receptor and how it decreases um, by inhibiting two mechanisms, it inhibits the production of nitric oxide causing vasodilation in a smooth muscle cell, but it also activates the neurotrophic factor kappa B, which then increases the reactive oxygen species produced and the expression of the adhesion molecules, which also decrease nitric oxide and which then impairs the ability for the endothelium to repair itself. Okay, so this busy slide basically talks about oxidative stress. Um, one study that they, they highlighted in the article, you know, there was in patients with rheumatoid arthritis, you saw increased reactive oxygen species, ROS, from the peripheral neutrophils, and that was associated with increased disease severity. Um, you also have the TNF alpha here in the middle, and that's been was shown to increase the NADPH oxidases, the NOxes, which then increase the reactive oxygen species, thereby decreasing nitric oxide availability and therefore decreasing ability for endothelial repair. So decreased nitric oxide ability also leads to that NF kappa B, which then stimulates the NOxes and you have this destructive negative feedback loop on the endothelial on the endothelium. And dyslipidemia is also um, in this paradigm as far as causing endothelial damage. Okay, so the oxidized LDLs are, are pretty much the what's implicated in this. And you have the mod modulation of the nitric oxide and the ROS production. It upregulates CAM expression on the endothelial surface and upregulates the secretion of the TNF alpha by inducing that neurotrophic factor again. Okay, autoantibodies in um, chronic inflammatory diseases. So they, they looked at this too to see, well, can we measure that and um, associate it with increased disease severity. So you've got AECA, anti-endothelial cell antibody found in autoimmune disease, such as lupus. They also looked at neurotrophic factor KB induction. Well, that's what it does. And it upregulates CAMS, um, increases CK production and endothelial damage and the vasculitis associated with lupus. Um, the antibodies to this oxidized LDL correlate with increased disease severity with um, increased concentrations of that. And um, you also see the antiphospholipid syndrome, which you have the increased clotting, increased miscarriages, and the antibodies to the APLs. And that's also been shown to have increased CAM expression. So I think there's some rheumatologists here, but most of us are um, integrative doctors. And so this slide just reviews what, what are they doing to treat um, endothelial function that's widely used, and methotrexate uh, is the main anti-inflammatory ther therapy that's still, the, I think, the mainstay of treatment for most rheumatologists. Um, by inhibiting folic acid metabolism, it thereby improves synovitis, 
associated rheumatoid arthritis. Um, you have the anti-TNF alpha agents like infliximab or Eternacept, and they've demonstrated improved endothelial vasodilation in rheumatoid arthritis patients as measured by the forearm blood flow test. They also saw reduced inflammatory bi biomarkers with the use of the anti-TNF alpha agents. And then there is um, corticosteroid use seen in, um, used in these diseases. And they showed in a 2011 review, there was mild increase in cardiovascular risk in some rheumatoid patients. But that's um, not, they haven't found that to be necessarily repeatable or reproducible across the board. There was another study that showed that increased, showed increased insulin resistance and obesity as well in the rheumatoid population. And then you have the statins, lots of um, studies on statins uh, that has been, I guess, you know, big pharma-like statins. And basically um, it showed improved endothelial function in patients and um, with the cardiovascular risk factors. There was one trial of um, atorvastatin in rheumatoid arthritis. It was the first randomized trial. And at six months, they showed improved biomarkers of disease severity as well as systemic inflammation compared to placebo, um, but they did not access specifically for endothelial function. So as far as the article conclusions, it showed that there is strong evidence for inflammatory disease processes in CIDs um, that are associated with accel accelerated atherosclerosis and endothelial dysfunction, most damage related to uh, the TNF-alpha inflammatory cytokines. And obviously a lot, of more, a lot more research is needed. So let's move on to a case study. Any comments at this point before I move on to a case? Figure we'll keep this kind of um, informal. Um, so this first one, well, let, let me tell you what, what we're doing in my clinic and thanks to Dr. Halasa who introduced us to, to this um, uh, testing. It's called Pulse for Pulse Testing is the name of the company. And it's completely non-invasive and it assesses ankle brachial index, arterial, um, measurements as well as pseudo motor response. Um, and all the patient has to do is take off their shoes. Um, they get to put their, foot, their hands on a glass plate as well as their feet and that gets measured um, through the use of the pulse ox and the blood pressure cuffs on their arms as well as in their um, legs and ankles. Uh, they get assessed for orthostatic hypotension uh, versus um, and also cardiac output and capillary refill or microvascular circulation. Um, so I'll show you a, a sample of the interpretation and a, a, a couple of things on how the report looks and how I use that to implement some of my integrative therapies. So this um, lady, she is a 62 year, 60 year old retired government worker, also a dog breeder with a history of chronic Lyme, Epstein-Barr virus, chronic fatigue, obstructive sleep apnea. Um, she was going through a significant loss and feeling depressed after she lost a parent and four of her dogs that she uses for breeding um, to cancer within a matter of six months. Um, she has been on, controlled fairly well on opioids which keep them functional. Um, her MME was under 100 and uh, it helps her with work through and be functional with her joint pains and their muscle pains. Um, she does have the stiffness and brain fog which uh, was decreased with uh, monthly ozone IVs. And uh, so she's been doing that for about a, about a year. And then she um, had the P4P testing a couple of weeks ago. So this is her report and some of my scribble on things that I, I um, implemented from that, uh, the test results. And so she was uh, shown to have moderate risk of pseudomonar autonomic neuropathy. And uh, microvascular disease compromise up to like 54%. Uh, so a couple of things, I, I didn't have a recent B12 and folate on her, so I did order that. Um, she was also shown to have an abnormal ABI and we did, I did refer her to a local vascular center for bilateral, ar bilateral arterial Dopplers. Um, she also had uh, sleep apnea. Um, well, she had the body mass in this, that was pretty high and she needed a new sleep study. So I referred her for that. Um, and since the chronic Lyme on physical exam, she has had noted hypermobility. 
And so I wasn't really surprised with the increased arterial elasticity and that dichrotic elasticity index. Um, and with all of the stress that she's been under, I wasn't surprised of her elevating blood pressure, um, both systolic and diastolic. So for that, I did a, a starter on L-arginine. And let's see, if you go further down, the central systolic pressure was also increased. And she also, I did also order uh, bilateral carotid duplexes. She did have a recent um, diagnosis of a TIA a few months ago that I forgot to note in the history. So things that she just started um, were doing the NAD IVs with her. Um, since NAD, there's some research on it being able to repair endothelium. Um, and I'm alternating that with her ozone IVs uh, for about eight months. I did start, start her on some nutraceuticals. Um, for her stress, I recommend that she do yin yoga twice a day and to also to help decrease her blood pressure. And she's getting plugged into psychotherapy and um, hypnotherapy as well. So that's just an example of one study. And now we can uh, go over this next person. Let's see, this next person. She is a 71 year old female with a history of fibromyalgia, autoimmune thyroiditis, chronic mono, post-surgical peritoneal adhesions, uh, degenerative joint disease, and she has cardiac risk factors of obstructive sleep apnea, paresthesias, leg pain with walking, hypothyroidism, depression, and upper limb symptoms. So this is the first page, what our arterial vascular assessment looked like. And it, it's kind of impossible to read on the screen. So I'll just highlight the abnormalities. Um, her, uh, she did have an abnormal ABI in the right leg. And let's see, that's pretty much the main thing on that page. We'll go to the next page of the report. And um, patients like seeing this, so I like the graphics as far as where is their tissue damage assessed based on their findings of the test. And so 67.45% risk for uh, pseudomotor autonomic neuropathy. And that puts her right in you know high risk, it's above 60. So that, that's mainly concerning. And then as far as the hands asymmetry and the feet asymmetry, uh, she scored 28% with her hands and anything over 20% is considered concerning and should be addressed. And uh, so with that said, uh, I'd like to see what or hear what uh, people would do for her if she walked into your clinic with these test results. Anyone have any comments? Can you still hear me? Yeah, yeah, we can hear you. I think okay. you did a very good presentation here. We like, I mean, it's very comprehensive. Um, I believe you, the tools that you're using, it's very essential for any doctor who claimed to be an integrative doctor. It's like, you know, if you're a cardiologist or you are a medical doctor, you have to have a stethoscope to monitor the heart and, and the blood pressure using that stethoscope. In order to monitor the efficacy of your integrative therapies, uh, you need to show that you are improving the endothelial function test. Because endothelial function test, if you improve it, that's mean your sex hormone is working, your CBD, a lot of people who are doing CBD is working, your probiotic is working, Mike Beamer, Methylene Blue is working, uh, Dr. Farshanik Sesomes is working, um, Dr. Bill uh, Peptides is working. How do you know it's working? You have to show some evidence and the best way is to use endothelial function tests in ANS. I think this will be your diagnostic tool to monitor the efficacy of all your integrative therapies to manage all kinds of chronic disease. That's how I see it. Um, what will be the best supplement? Uh, Burbian. Uh, I think it will be the top to manage all the metabolic diseases. It's, uh, it's as effective, as even more effective in some studies than metformin. And it lowers the cholesterol, the sugar, it decreases sensitivity to insulin. I think this will be the best for improving the theory function test. I know you're doing NID, but Burbian will be uh, my first choice along with low diet. Uh, and I will hear other doctors what they suggest if they come up to the mic. 
And then I'm, I'm gonna just put CoQ10 on here. It's hard to read on this page, but it did show some decreased cardiac output um, noted uh, kind of right there, I believe is where it is. Hard to read. I didn't know how else to, to put these um, things up. Any other participants, please? Uh, um, Dr. Kevin, you wanna say something? Yeah, one thing that I would like to see is uh, carnosine. It's a, it's a peptide, um, but carnosine, I've been using it a lot. Whenever there's any autonomic dissociation and she was diagnosed with an autonomic uh, disorder here with the pulse broke pulse, carnosine, if, I don't know if anyone else has tried it. It's a real simple, it's just a dye peptide. But in the body, it's like a simple molecule like nitric oxide, seems like a, a simple player, but has huge ramifications. And carnosine, from the best that I can discern, it's, it's helping the autonomic uh, nervous system communicate properly with all the organs in the body. We're still figuring out exactly all the roles that it plays and what it does. Um, so again, you know, it'd be interesting to see how, how what were the results would be uh, if we had the time individually to add each one of these things, berberine and coenzyme Q10 and see the changes as you go. Um, but uh, throw them all in together and, and I'm sure, and it's safe, you know, I mean, carnosine, CoQ10, uh, berberine, you know, this is one of the advantages of, uh, of doing an integrative approach is we're, 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 we're adding things to standard care that are only going to help. What's, what's nice about this, like I'm, I'm excited about the, this is the patient's initial test, but um, insurance, Medicare and Medicaid and insurance does cover most of this. Um, and they cover it to be done up to four times a year. So I told my patients we should recheck after we do these interventions in another three months and, um, and just yeah. see progress. So that part is kind of exciting so they can see, oh yeah, I am doing something, moving the needle forward. Um, so that part's exciting. Uh, it's hard to read here, but I just wanted to share with everyone. So her blood pressure was normal um, and her peripheral vascular system showed uh, normal levels of ejection elasticity, dicrotic dilatation and dicrotic elasticity. Um, in her cardiovascular system assessment, no abnormal heartbeats and um, ventricular extrasystole and uh, atrial extrasystole were also normal. Um, her, let's see, we had been working on her diet. So her BMI is at 28.2, it was higher last year. And um, let's see, abnormal ABI, as I mentioned before, and uh, it does show the microvascular disease is present. So that is about it for those findings. Okay, I think that really concludes you my add, presentation. Read, that will be also something you make us yeah. mm -hmm. oh, What did you say? I'll put it on Omega here. Three. Right, yes, omega-3. And, and omega -3. Uh, did you check <laughs> yeah. her vitamin D? Yeah, she is on vitamin D. Um, okay, how much the level, did, did you have any lab? Uh, it, it, it was when I first saw her last year was like less than 10. And mm -hmm. so she's up to 40 now. And I told her my goal is between 60 and 75 for her levels. Good. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, just to make sure, you know, the major, even if, you, if she, they are on vitamin D, as Dr. Kevin said, he was on vitamin D and exposure to the sun. And uh, how much the level was? 45? It, yeah. It was yeah. at 45. I was taking what I thought was an adequate dose, 5,000 units a day, making a concerted effort to make sure I get sun exposure. And I checked my levels and it was still only at 45. And that's the reason I told them the best uh, source of vitamin D and mixed with all the other essential oils is using uh, cod liver oil. And I, for myself, I, I compare between cod liver oil and capsules of vitamin D, I find cod liver oil is more better in increasing the, or the bioavailability for vitamin D. The absorption is better and you get the full spectrum of the essential oil. So something you may be considered um, if they have problem with getting the vitamin D level high with, uh, with the regular capsules, they may consider adding uh, a teaspoon or tablespoon of uh, cod liver oil at night. Do you make sure that 
Do you make sure that you're using vitamin K as well? The ones I recommend does have the K2 in it as well. But not right. if not the prescription. That's just plain old vitamin D2. No, no, and no. It, it doesn't work very well. <laughs> Correct. No. Um, just to add to one of your stories about the, your vitamin D level. So one of my colleagues who's an anesthesia pain doctor, African-American lady living in Hawaii, um, lived on the beach and literally was on the beach like every day after work. And her vitamin D level was four. <laughs> right. Wow. Four. So she, she had That's mega good. resuscitation to do. <laughs> right. Okay. Dr. Kevin was telling me about his wife too. She's, yeah. She lived in the Bahamas. Yeah. So, go ahead. Well, yeah. So I had put all my family on vitamin D, especially when COVID came along. And she was taking it, but she stopped because she teaches when she was able to resume uh, her functional fitness classes. So she teaches classes in the morning and in the afternoon. And she goes and does things during the day in the garden. And she thought that, you know, she's also trained as a nutritionist. She thought I'm getting enough vitamin D. So she stopped taking her vitamin D, right? And she, act, I don't know how much of the story I should tell, but she had a, she had a chillblains reaction to the COVID-19 AstraZeneca vaccine, vaccination. So Dr. Halassus suggested you better check her vitamin D level and, and some other uh, tests. And sure, and I was even skeptical. I was like, you know, but anyway, she was low. She's, she's at 26, you know, and, and that shocked even my wife because she's like, how can it be? Because she does take vitamin T occasionally, but she wasn't taking it regularly because she figured, oh, I'm out in the sun and I'm doing stuff. But no, you know, we, we underestimate our body's own ability to make vitamin D, which is what I think Dr. Halasa was saying is that that even to getting the, the regular vitamin D that's made from, you know, lanolin or something like that, um, it, a more natural source like cod liver oil is probably better getting it from our diet. Uh, and one would think getting it from the sun, but then again, you have to ask yourself, well, where does the sun make it in our body? It does make it from the fats and the cholesterols in our blood and, and the endothelial function is probably fit playing a role there because the, the microvascular sort of that's just under the skin that's reacting to the sun. So there's a lot of factors that are, that are happening that, that uh, we just cannot really account for. But I think the pulse for pulse is going to get, give a better uh, example. So I don't have any personal experience yet with the pulse for, for pulse. I'm still arranging that, but uh, it'd be interesting. There's a lot of things running through my mind. It's like, why is it that my wife's vitamin D level wasn't good? She's physically fit. We eat well, we grow our own food in the garden. You know, there's so, so much that we're doing right. And yet, so I'm getting my vitamin D levels checked tomorrow morning. <laughs> You know, so we'll see. And I, I can tell you, I take 5,000 units every day. And some days I take another dose at the end of the day, especially if I've seen and had to deal with a COVID patient or something like that. You know, I just, just do it. And that's been my routine, but we'll see. <laughs> Maybe on another uh, conference call, I'll, I'll update everyone. <laughs> I have a simple question. If you are taking um, up to say 20 to 50,000 units of D3 a day, and the uh, D3 is still too low, you know, 40 or below. Um, what is your number one suspect that would be causing that if you are not having the uh, bioavailability as Dr. Halasa says? Number one suspect is what? Genomic. Uh, the company is producing it. <laughs> yeah. Genomic. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah genomic and I, like the lifestyle is a person in the under excruciating stress. Do they have a chronic illness on top of a stressful job? Because I see that, you know, they get depleted of vitamins and minerals a lot. So you've ruled out the SNP on vitamin D when there's high stress and it's not the issue? Oh, that's just what I do first. I don't know about the, the SNP. I have some DNA testing, but um, a lot of my patients, because I take insurance, they don't pay for it. So I'm, no. I'm not able to do that type of genomic testing. Yeah, just go ahead with liver cod oil and find out with your patients if that will help to speed up. 
I think it will be a best option right now. But if you do have some, the, the patient has money and resources and you can do genetic testing, why not? Just see if there's any primarily absorption metabolism vitamin D. That would be great. Thank you. I have a question uh, with the wealth of knowledge on this call. So uh, do oh, any of you guys have a good treatment for chronic Epstein-Barr virus? Um, so what I've been able to diagnose it by checking the, the antibodies for their chronic fatigue. And we do, you know, between ozone and I use Desbio's uh, homeopathic four-month protocol and I add natocerazine for any biofilms. Um, and we get some success with that. We've been able to, you know, uh, get rid of all the antibodies and put them in remission, but it's a long haul. And um, I'm just curious if anyone has, oh, we also add monolaurin in the mix sometimes, if there's any like, Wonder, wonder protocol that you guys have found to help with that. Okay, so I'll okay, go, so go, 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 go ahead, go ahead. Who's gonna speak? I was gonna say phototherapy, Dr. Hawass. So yeah, yeah, methylene blue photodynamic therapy will be one from Mike Beamer. And then you do thymosin alpha, do two things. One, polarize the immune system to TH1. Second, give uh, 10 milligram methylene blue and uh, possibly if you have the whole body exposure of the red light, that'll be nice. If not, um, you know, if you find exactly what areas you think the, the virus is hitting and you can target with the light, that's fine. If not, just exposing to regular sun will activate the methylene blue as well in the body. Uh, but thymosin alpha, um, which is Dr. Uh, William Clifford is expertise and he will tell you about the whole uh, dosage and everything. Are you there, Dr. William? Dr. William, are you there? I'm here. Clifford. I'm Come here. On, you're the boss, man. I'm, I'm here. here. Remember that. <laughs> I got it. I, 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 you remind me every week <laughs> that I'm the boss. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Anybody have any questions? Uh, how are we doing here? Doing fine? We need you to talk about thymosin alpha uh, for viral infection. Did you hear the question? Um, I didn't. I had actually stepped out of the room. Right. I will, uh, so uh, I will so they, they, uh, do you want to repeat the question, Dr. Mary? Uh, sure. Um, well, uh, just curious to see what, what uh, other tools folks use on this call to treat chronic or reactivated Epstein-Barr virus and folks with... Um, the positive antibodies and the chronic fatigue. So I've been doing, you know, a combination of ozone IVs, homeopathics, and uh, nanosterazine for biofilms and some monolaurin. And um, uh, yes. Okay, so yeah, I've used uh, uh, humic acid and monolaurin. I like that one a lot, um, as opposed to monolaurin alone. Um, we've used, um, I like uh, high, pretty high dose in acetylcysteine. Um, we like that, and we, we also sometimes have the patients come in and we do IV glutathione. We just do it as a push. So we don't make a big deal about it. We don't charge, I think we charge $20 for a shot. It doesn't cost that much. There's a fusion group up the, up the hill from me here that's charging $300 for a 200 or 300 milligrams of, uh, of uh, glutathione with a, with a, in an IV bag. With Those are some, Prices. Those are Northern Virginia prices. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, I know. They're Hollywood <laughs> prices. Um, what about the peptide? And, uh, alpha? Yep. Because that's what you did. Well, again, the problem with thymus and alpha is we can't, we're, we're having a hard time it's getting it. it. And, uh, right. But is it, you think uh, it will work? You know, regardless um, of. Uh, it, it, it probably should have, should have some, some, some pretty good properties again, you know, what you're looking at. Um, I like um, alternating them, thymosin alpha-1 and thymosin beta-4, and I usually do um, three weeks on, one week off, and then I switch, I switch them. Where do you guys, I usually uh, do that first. where do you order that from? Well, that's the problem. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, we, uh, we, we, we have a couple, there's a place out of Houston that says they, they, they have some of it now, and then they say, I mean, Empower, and then uh, the, once, once it's used up, it's used up, so. You know, our, our friends at the FDA are uh, decided that this was this was verboten. I guess uh, maybe it worked against this virus or not. Whether that's why it has, it has to be stamped out. Um, 
So, um, so usually a, a combination of that, of those three, at least to start. And then, you know, you don't know me, but I, I'm the hormone guy. So we make sure the hormones are balanced. Um, and um, with some IV, high dose vitamin C and then IV vitamin C. Have you had, um, we've had issues getting sterile water for high dose vitamin C for a while. Are, are, is that gotten better over um, or worse? <laughs> I, I, we have a, we have a compounding pharmacy in town. I'm in Reno. We have a compounding pharmacy in town here to get it from them. So far, I haven't had any problem. As long as we um, brought up the virus um, or the Epstein Barr, is anyone using I, I, Argentin 23 and other forms of really refined colloidal silver? Uh, yes. It's hard to get. Like back when the pandemic started, I couldn't get our no, anywhere. It, that was <laughs> it was short for about uh, three months. They're in full production now with Argentin 23, which is the supposedly the good stuff, the fine stuff. And what were you saying, Kevin, about that? Yeah, I I, I had used Argentin 23, berberine uh, combination, and 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 gotten good results. So a uh, pretty high dose of uh, berberine, just sort of regular dose of the Argentin 23. Okay. And something I'll add in powder Arco also. And what is that? Powder Arco. But I think it's mainly the berberine that's doing the doing the, the, the main work there along with the Argentin 23. Thank you. Yeah. Bar oh, berberine is getting the seven stars now. Yeah, it is an oral Argentin 23. Just yeah. Like yeah, just just oral. I know some people have done it intravenous and other meth, other routes, but I just put people on it orally. Well, the other, the other question I noticed uh, with Dr. Babcock, I think you were showing that you give um, NAD, and is that by IV? Yes. And is this the same NADH in the Krebs cycle yeah. that we're giving? The so NAD it, that gets converted to NADH. Then is it yeah. possible to give NADH uh, orally with Inada that product? Cause that'd Possibly. Be a, yeah, because it only costs like a dollar a day to keep up with that 20 milligrams. And that's oral and it's available. Do they have it or not? It's it's not. Stock. I'm going to find out tomorrow. And by the way, I noticed the, the price on the Inada went up about uh, 30, 40% in the last month or two. So it's going up. Wow. But it works. It's been around for 20 some years. Okay, um, any, any other questions, comments? Um, we have uh, Mr. Ken. Ken uh, yeah, Ken uh, Beck is going to. Let's give him 10 minutes commercial break. You want to give him that? Yes, absolutely. Asking him Ken. to unmute now He's if you're there. there. right? Can you see him? See a. Uh, Ken. Ken Beck is here. Ken is here, right? Ken Beck. Are you there, Ken Beck? Yes, hi, everyone. Let Hello. me give you the, uh, so you can share oh, your slide. Yeah. Um, Great. One second here. Oh, so what's going on with me? I don't know. I have been, I, um, one second, one second. Make a host now. How I can do co-host him. One second. Let me let me try to put give you a, a co-host. Okay, you're co-host already. Okay, go ahead. Oh, great. Uh, your slide. Let's please, see. Please. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm trying to figure it out myself. Uh, go down the share screen here. Okay. Uh, He's co-host, right? Now he's co-host here. Okay. Right. Oh no, you're not. No. Okay, you're make not co-host. Host. How I can make it? Make him? host now. I oh, can make, make him a host. No, no, make. Uh, I think. Um, okay, I'll make you a host. That's fine. Then I will claim it. Just go ahead. Here we go. Yeah. You're gonna be the boss of the bus. <laughs> uh, <laughs> thank you, everyone. Uh, how how are things in there in the Bahamas? Oh, everything is great. Your yeah. friend Kevin is here next to me. 
Uh, hi, Ken. Hi, Doc. Hi. hi, Ken. How are you? I'm doing okay. I'm doing a lot better. Oh, great. You know, I, I, had a, I had a rough time on the weekend, but I'm, I'm doing a lot better thanks to Methylene Blue in the most part. Oh, thank you. I, I, that's, that's awesome. And, and I, I want to uh, thank Dr. Babcock for a great uh, presentation again. And we, we very uh, much appreciate it. And, and, um, and I, I just want to take a, a, a brief few minutes, if you don't mind, uh, and share what we offer. And really, uh, our goal is to uh, make as simple as possible uh, the use of the equipment that we provide. And, and we're Pulse for Pulse and uh, Premier Autonomic Vascular and Cardio Risk Assessment Tool across the US. And uh, practitioners, hospitals, and their patients all benefit uh, from the diagnostic screening that we offer. And our mission statement is to empower the physician to proactively identify disease indicators in asymptomatic patients by utilizing cutting edge preventative screenings uh, while improving the overall patient experience. And this is what we offer really and truly a turnkey system. Uh, we provide the equipment, it's state of the art, uh, Rolls Royce of the industry, it's about uh, 40 plus thousand dollars at absolutely no cost to the physician. We also uh, provide a medical technician who's on our payroll. Once again, uh, no cost to uh, you doctor and as well as that we uh, the technician knows how to explain the test to the patient. They perform the tests and provide real-time results and recommendations immediately. So uh, we're, we're not a burden on the staff and we're certainly not, not a, a burden on, uh, in, in your pocketbook or wallet. Uh, we also uh, provide a billing support uh, and we can do pre-authorizations, uh, we can do the billing, and we, and thank you uh, uh, to Dr. Halaza for helping us uh, uh, put together a cash program, uh, cash and travel program for doctors who don't uh, take insurance. So we, we do the intake form, as well for the clinical qualifiers and medical necessity. So it's truly a turnkey system. We, we truly don't, don't need the doctors or their staff to lift a finger. And what we come in and, and we do all the work, we wanna be like Navy SEALs. We don't want anyone truly to even know where that we're there. We uh, work and mirror the workflow of the office. And, and stay out of uh, everyone's way and truly do all the work. We're passionate about prevention. And what if you could quickly evaluate patients for several chronic illnesses right from your office without having to refer out? 60% of adult patients qualify. And we can detect disease at a microvascular level and take steps to prevent catastrophic life threatening events. And once in a while we get a question, well, how strong are the billing codes for people that take insurance? And not only uh, we've been blessed, they've been very strong, they've actually have gone up uh, it, the reimbursements and not because necessarily insurance company are nice people, but they want to save money. And they finally figured out it's less expensive to keep people healthy and, and take preventative actions rather than uh, have a, uh, a horrible event like a heart attack or stroke or worse, costing many tens of thousands of dollars in the hospital. So, and, and now we've even seen some insurance companies require this testing for risk mitigation. So it's absolutely done a 180 uh, uh, for someone like myself who's been in the industry for uh, more decades than I care to admit. So 
it, it, it's absolutely the time has come. And uh, of course, Dr. Babcock and, and Dr. Laws are, are experts uh, in, uh, in the information and the importance of it. Uh, by not correctly identifying the chronic disease early, patients will likely suffer more risk due to, uh, to health and in invasive and costly interventions. Uh, PAD untreated can lead to gangrene amputation or four to five times uh, greater risk for heart attack or stroke. And these are the main uh, tests to identify the disease and neuropathies. And uh, the first test really is two parts. It's the uh, ANS testing uh, and endothelial dysfunction, which uh, uh, Dr. Halazi and Dr. Babcock uh, did a, d do a wonderful job explaining. I'm, I'm, I'm not a physician, so they're, they're truly the experts, not me. Uh, we do the pseudomotor testing and uh, ankle branchial index. Again, this is the, the latest technology and all state of the art. Real-time results and recommendations. Uh, we have a very uh, uh, colorful red light, yellow light, green light, including all the normal ranges for uh, in our uh, comprehensive report. This is actually a sample page and our CMO, uh, Dr. Mongaluzzo, is uh, just never satisfied. We actually include, or, or will be including a, uh, a 3D image of the heart and it, it constantly adding to this. And this is based on our proprietary algorithm. But doctors have commented, they absolutely love this report. Once again, it's handed uh, right to the doctor upon completion of the test, which is non-invasive, 15 to 20 minutes. And it's administered by our technician, so you don't have to rely on uh, having an extra staff member. These are the five billing codes. The, the billing codes do not include the complex follow-up code the, uh, for the office visits, which is uh, can add up rather quickly. And uh, as uh, Dr. Mary, uh, so I eloquently said, we can test up to four times per year. Insurance will cover that with the first test being the baseline. We're, we're finding that, uh, that in fact, it greatly increases the patient compliance because if the patient knows they're going back to the doctor every quarter, uh, and they're quite possibly going to make the, the right uh, uh, food choices, maybe exercise a little more and, and be much more compliant. This is uh, uh, one of my favorite slides and certainly doctors look at this and kind of raise their eyebrows, especially in areas with uh, elderly uh, patients. And we truly only need one condition for eligibility. In fact, uh, the doctors look at us and say, wait a minute, my, most of my patients will check all these blocks, not just one, but it's very easy to qualify for the testing. We only use 60% as a national average, but the doctors uh, on, in the academy and on this call, certainly I, I like to refer to you as super doctors. Generally, it's much higher than 60%. Our proformas that we use are based on 30% of the patients will take the test. So we, uh, we know, and maybe I'm old fashioned, but when my doctor tells me to do something, I listen. I don't ask any questions, I just do it. We're saying that half of the 60% will actually take the test. And it, once again, generally much higher than that, but would it rather over deliver and, and by under promising. Finances and revenue, as you can see, it's, it's quite lucrative. And, you know, we might, doctors work so hard and they have so many things against them. And, and truly our, our mission is, is really twofold. One, to help the doctors and two, help the patients. And, and, and helping the doctors, uh, why shouldn't we keep the revenue in your office, in your practice, instead of sending them out to a diagnostic center or somewhere. You, 
you uh, folks have all the expense, the overhead, and, and you absolutely deserve it. Uh, all the funds go to the doctor. Every single penny uh, the doctors are in control of. And then Pulse bills on paid EOBs for, uh, for the service. So um, an average is that you will net 160 to 170 per test per patient. That's after Pulse is paid. That does not include the complex office visit codes. And these figures are based on one test per year, not four tests per year. Once again, we like to under-promise and over-deliver. But this is based on the number of providers. And certainly, we have many offices uh, that have more than one provider. But the kind of the magic number for a full-time tech is five screenings per day. That's on insurance-based. You can see the, the revenue truly uh, adds up. So we're, we're very happy to say that we've helped many, many physicians, uh, uh, MSOs, IPAs, and even hospitals across the country. We just want to make it as easy as possible for you to get, get the information you need, plus uh, have new revenue into the practice. This is a summary, a cardiovascular risk assessment, proactively identify the uh, disease indicators, asymptomatic patients, and increase patient compliance with treatments. It's 160 to 170 per screening and up to 204 per year per physician. Now we say up to because certainly depending on insurance, uh, city, state, uh, type of provider and uh, demographics and contracts, that can vary. It could be more and it could actually be a little less, but we want to be win-win and we use a uh, sliding and weighted average to make certain that it's it's profitable for the doctors. We increase uh, office visits up to 20% we've seen, and we have a little signage or uh, even a poster with the doctor's blessing and permission uh, kind of promoting the test of just very professionally. And we are finding that patients are referring other patients to clinics because the asymptomatic testing and underlying conditions related to COVID can be extremely important is what we have been taught. And sadly, our CMO says many of the people who are no longer with us due to those underlying conditions due to COVID. Uh, downstream revenue from multi-specialty groups, no capital expenditure or staff training, and no burden on the billing staff. Uh, this is my contact, and I, I just I want to turn it back over to uh, Dr. Halaza, and uh, and I want to say a, a special hello to to Dr. Clearfield as well, and and thank him for uh, having us on tonight. Thank you so much, everyone. We're very happy to 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 set a private Zoom with you, answer any questions, and. We'll make, uh, we're very, very flexible and we'll do whatever we possibly can to, to get this equipment in your hands. Thank you so much. Great, thank you, Ken. Thank you. So, um, anybody have any uh, comments, questions? Um, I wanna let our conference uh, Attendees know that I have, as of this morning, finished all the paperwork, and now I just have to figure out who, who, whose hands it gets into. So you will become official. You will get your official CME credits. So that's all done. Um, our group, uh, our, our uh, conference with the uh, Nevada Osteopathic Medical Association looks like it's gonna be an add-on and not a, not a separate one. <clears throat> So I'm actually looking to do something a little bit different. Um, Las Vegas at the end of July is not exactly the most pleasant uh, destination. Um, so I'm looking for late August, early September, either Las Vegas or Scottsdale um, is my next is my next uh, my my next look. We do have OMED, which is in, in um, October. Hopefully it'll be live, which is in Phoenix this year. 
um, and um, uh, <clears throat> um, if anybody needs uh, and has any any comments, any uh, information, any um, any any type of, uh, of volunteering, anything anything at all, um, I need some help. Um, I'm looking into getting um, some help so that possibly we can make these Tuesday night um, uh, uh, soirees um, CME credits, but you know the paperwork is, on, is, is onerous and it's taken me two and a half weeks of almost full time uh, night and day to get the, uh, the the conference that we had two weeks ago you know ready ready to be uh, accredited. So, um, anybody else have any um, questions, Dr. Babcock? If you're still there, thank you so much. Um, Dr. Uh, Mr. Beck, Dr. Beck, um, it's always a pleasure. Dr. Halasa, you're a, you're a saint. Um, you know, you're the straw, straw that stirs the drink. Um, and of course, Dr. Spear, I see you're there. So, uh, you know, he's our, he's our patriarch, um, as, as along with Dr. Burgess. So, um, also one last thing, a little, little plug, if you, we're, I'm speaking at a live conference next weekend in, in next weekend in uh, Miami at Age Management Medical Group. I'm doing our um, uh, post finasteride syndrome, which we did at our conference um, up, up on a on a live stage. And I, I always do the last uh, co uh, lecture of the conference, and they, they, they had shut me out, but uh, apparently they needed me again. Remember ours? We had one we were one credit hour short last year, and I had to jump in make sure everybody got it had enough hours so uh, it, it happens it happens with the big big guys too so um, if you can make it to Miami that would be great it's also online it's agemed.org uh, agemed.org um, and uh, it's pretty reasonable um, they have a lot of good uh, a lot of good speakers I think um, some of our uh, speakers we've had uh, are, are speaking also um, and they do, you know, anti-aging, they do hormone replacement. There'll be a lot of COVID stuff, uh, the stuff that we're all interested in. Um, so a little- I will be, I'm, I'm going to be there because I have uh, some- All right, no tomatoes. You there. You're not allowed to have any tomatoes, you know, to, to throw, okay? That's... <laughs> so, no, so we're going to meet there. Uh, okay, great. At that conference. Great. Uh, it's the, it's, is it the age med, right? Age med, age management medical. Yeah, age med, it's at the Doral National in Miami. Um, it's pretty right. reasonable. It's a really a nice place. Um, and uh, we were there before. Um, I was in Miami a couple of weeks ago and it's pretty open. You know, the hotel lobbies and whatnot, you have to wear a mask, but other than that, uh, most everything was pretty open. So, um, and right. this place is a five-star hotel. Really is. Yeah, I got I got a company who's going to sponsor me, so I'm going to be there. So we'll see you there then. We're going to okay. have some. All right. Well, I'm so, fasting at that time. I'm not going to fast or not. I mean, I have a license not to fast, but I may be fasting. <laughs> okay. But <laughs> well, we can have dinner after in the dark. That's fine. You're going to be fasting. You know. You know. I had a, I had a, a uh, I had somebody here during Ramadan, and I felt terrible because you know I you know, I have to eat every two hours or or I collapse. So. And he was, you know, he's a young kid though, so he could, he could handle it. So, <laughs> so no, they, we are allowed to, if, if we are traveling, it's very clear, we are allowed to eat. And then we, you know, you compensate it after you finish the Ramadan. Uh -huh. But I did it before one time and I ate at Ramadan, but I don't know. I just don't feel right. You feel, you feel, so gonna feel guilty. Know. We can't make you feel guilty there. So. <laughs> but we can do dinner, um, you know, and we can eat our, uh, all you can eat, yeah. You can sure. eat after sundown, right? Yes, the yeah, sun. Yeah, yeah. yeah, just just look at the sun when the sun sets, yeah. then we can go ahead and have okay. a big dinner there. Okay. All right. So, All right. Well. All right. Well, I'm looking forward to seeing you. Um, and if anybody else can make it, uh, you know, we can have our own little little contingent. Um, um, they're they're a good group. Um, they're not A4M. They're 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 a lot smaller. They're a lot more friendly, I think. Um, and uh, uh, there's a lot more camaraderie there. Not as much as with us, but but uh, but there but there is some. So, so, and of course, you know, when I give my talks, I always throw in little surprises. So, Dr. Halasi, make sure you don't miss it. Okay. So, okay. I'll anybody else? Anybody else? Any questions? Uh, complaints? Comments? Um, in case you missed it, um, the 
Uh, everything is ready. If you haven't got, if you were at our conference and you haven't gotten a, a signed certificate, I know they went 20 or so, so went out unsigned. I apologize for that. If you haven't gotten a signed certificate, let me know. <laughs> um, and oh, all of the paperwork uh, ready to go. So um, as soon as I figure out where it's supposed to go, uh, it'll get there. Um, and uh, um, that's it, over and out. Dr. Burgess, you still there? Anything to say? I'm here and I'm happy, that's all. Good. Thank you, Thank you everybody. Oh, yeah. You're, you're always happy, okay. All right, everybody. Um, good. Wait, there's some chats here. Let's see. Okay, let's see. Scottsdale would be great. Uh, your next uh, thing, Dr. Scottsdale. Everybody likes Scottsdale. Okay, Scottsdale looks like the consensus. Uh, um, or, or Bahamas here. Or the Bahamas. Where the sharks. With the yeah. sharks. Okay. All right. Well, now, well, we're looking for late uh, late August, early early September. So. Uh, I have a I have a, uh, a an aversion to hurricanes. So, um, like I said, I've lived through enough of them. <laughs> okay, I'm sure. Okay, um, okay, everybody, good night, and we will see you next week, and um, we will um, have another um, very exciting um, speaker. Please uh, let your colleagues know that we're here, um, so we can grow our group. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, good on. night. Ron, good night. Good to see you. Good night. And Brad, good to see you. And Denise Akavani, I don't think I know you, but you're here every week. Thank you, Dr. Ching. Uh, and Dr. Renza, uh, you, you know, I think it's time to, to uh, root for another team. Uh, the Eagles uh, it really should be just eight six. So, okay, everybody. Good night. Hey, good night. Okay, and we will. Good night. Uh, Bye. Bye.